Good afternoon, everyone. We're really excited to be with you here at COP27 uh, for what is the first of a three session set of panels that we're doing in consecutive days this week, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Uh, for those who don't know, um, we're, these are being sponsored by Comonix International. Comonix is a global uh, development consulting firm uh, with headquarters in the US and the UK and with activities throughout the developing world across uh, the full spectrum of economic growth and social development uh, sectors and issues. <clears throat> Before I introduce the actual uh, panel today, I did want to make a quick plug for a new program uh, that we're very excited about that we are implementing at Comonix uh, in partnership with USAID. This program is focused on uh, climate finance and uh, looks to massively scale up the resources that are available to address the climate uh, crisis, both uh, for adaptation and mitigation activities. The name of that program is the Climate Finance for Development Accelerator. And if you'd like more information about that program, you can go to climatelinks.org uh, and look for our landing page there. I believe we have a QR code at the back of the room that you can scan in order to see that. And if you are an organization that would like to potentially partner with us on the CFDA program, um, there is also a QR code you can scan that will take you to an intake form that will allow you to uh, enter all, all of your organization's information, uh, whether you are a potential investor, uh, an organization seeking investment uh, funding, or if you, have, uh, if you provide services that are part of the climate uh, finance ecosystem and you'd like to uh, work with us on that. So you can find both of those in the back of the room uh, if you'd like to know more information about that program. Uh, so the today's, today's program focuses on uh, climate drivers that affect uh, conflict. And so we have a set of speakers today who will be discussing different aspects of uh, climate and conflict dynamics. And so without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn the uh, session over to the moderator, uh, Brian App. Greetings, everybody. Happy to see you here. So climate change stresses social, economic, environmental, and political systems acting as a multiplier for existing factors that can enhance the likelihood of and impacts from conflict. I mean, for example, climate-related decreases in livelihood productivity such as impacts of drought on agriculture, can increase competition for resources and necessitate individuals and communities to relocate and search for food, water, or work to provide for themselves and their families. At the same time, enhanced, increased frequency of catastrophic events such as hurricanes and flooding can damage critical infrastructure and limit access to critical services, health, health services, economic services. <clears throat> Meanwhile, both of these challenges can lead to increased water and power rationing and increased prices, which, especially in urban areas, <clears throat> exacerbate existing uh, social inequalities and fault lines. So further, where conflict and insecurity exist, it limits the resilience and ability of communities to respond uh, and adapt to climate shocks. So the impacts of climate change can be felt on many levels. Um, on the level of the individual, um, increases of t in temperature correlated with increases in acts of violence. Or conversely, people avoid the heat, remain indoors, increasing sadness, uh, stress, and isolation. At the level of cities and nations, socioeconomic inequalities can lead to differentiated impacts of, of climate outcomes, leading to riots, um, unrest, and acts of violence. And at the national and regional level, the broke breakdown of productive livelihoods and increasing competition for scarce resources may render government plans and policies ineffective and create refugees and internally displaced people. Now, a better understanding of the connection between climate and conflict, however, 
and employing the appropriate analysis tools and integrated programming can help diminish compound climate fragility risks in complex prevention, mitigation, and recovery activities. Now, both climate and conflict are complex systems, and experts in each typically simplify the complexities they see in the others. It is therefore critical for researchers and practitioners in both disciplines to engage, communicate, and learn from one another to build a critical understanding of the interaction of these two areas. Now today's panel brings together expertise from the climate and conflict disciplines and attempts to demonstrate how we can use evidence to better understand outbreaks of conflict, how we can use evidence and understanding of the conflict and the conf climate and conflict nexus to improve humanitarian assistance, advance peace building, and support local development agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm here from London, where I um, work on the, as Brian said, UK aid funded cross border conflict evidence policy and trends research program. Uh, thank you. This is, a, as Brian said, um, a multi year, multidisciplinary program that tries to understand how conflicts connect across borders, what drives violent and peaceful behavior, and how policy responses should adapt to more effectively address the transnational dimensions of conflict. Chemonics and the Asia Foundation each lead portions of this program, which includes multiple partners. If you can show the next slide, which has a map and uh, lists some of our, our key partners along the bottom. Uh, our part, together with our partners, we're undertaking mixed, met mixed methods research in both field and remote on conflict dynamics. There's some behavioral research and really a focus on policy responses. The program also has a research fund that allows us to extend the research organizations participating in the program, including of the priority for local research. Our research traces, as, as, as this map shows, the dynamics and effects of conflict along long transnational pathways that traverse areas of significant climate stress in Africa from west to east, across the Red Sea to Yemen, up through Lebanon, Syria, over to Iraq, and further east to parts of South and Southeast Asia, notably Afghanistan and Myanmar. You can take the slide down now. I'll do the rest without slides. I was asked to um, speak to you all today about how research on climate and conflict intersects. You're all here because you are interested in this topic, um, and so I'm going to not going to spend a lot of time try, really talking about the nature of this interaction, but I want to just make a few uh, top line points. The first point is, as a research program, we, there's, a, there's a growing body of research about causality, and we're not really trying to prove um, that climate stresses are, are a causal factor for conflict. We accept this reality. Uh, we're also not trying to necessarily weight climate stress as um, in, terms, in relation to other factors that cause conflict. We see this essentially as a two-way street. Um, climate effects exacerbate conflict risks by driving, and I think Brian went through some of these, food insecurity, propelling mi migration and people movement, intensifying the competition over resources, and increasing tensions within and among groups. Climate, likewise, accelerates, cl sorry, conflict, likewise, accelerates climate change because there are uh, damage to the environment, there's destruction of natural resources, uh, contamination of, of the environment, inability to access land, change in the patterns of behavior, all due to uh, protracted conflict over time. There's an important point here, I think, from the conflict research perspective. I, I mentioned a two-way street. When you really think about conflict, it's actually far more complex. It's a web of interactions. Environmental factors are only one. There are political, economic, social, and demographic factors that all combine in varied ways, which depend very much on the context. It's a tough nut to crack. In essence, we think about it as a, a web or a system that we're always trying to unravel the threads of. And here is one of the, some of the key challenges that face researchers trying to do this. First, how do you 
unravel these interrelated threads in each context without getting lost in a particular strand, because you need to kind of look at the whole. Second, how do you accept this whole um, and come to policy relevant conclusions without getting overwhelmed by it? There's, a, it, there's a international acceptance of the need to think holistically about conflict, and it's now well accepted that uh, responses and interventions need to work at multiple levels and from multiple directions and sectors, humanitarian, security, peace building, and development. They need to be integrated and operate over time. How do, how do conflict researchers put forward a, a, appropriate solutions that deal with all these causal factors while remaining fundamentally realistic about the constraints on international and donor resources to try to address the problem sets. Achieving a balanced, a balanced response, one that responds to near-term imper imperatives to stabilize conflict while laying the groundwork for sustainable peace and development and making room for climate adaptation is sort of the um, holy grail of conflict research. Of course, I, I wanna offer a bit of a disclaimer. I, I don't have you know, our program doesn't have the answer. I don't believe anyone has the answer. What I really want to do today is talk about some ways that we approach this problem set. One of the most important things um, as a research program is we really try to mix disciplines and methods to deal with a complex system. Unraveling the conflict system in a way that supports its transformation requires looking at the problem through different lenses. That's in, both in terms of specializations and in terms of your methodological approaches. This probably sounds obvious to you all and, and should be for a research program, but it's actually much harder when first, the array of causal factors to be studied requires areas of expertise that do not routinely or naturally engage with each other. Just for example, there are conflict experts, climate scientists, livelihood specialists. This is just to name a few um, and they generally operate in different spheres. Second, uh, second key challenge for us as conflict researchers is that access to conflict affected areas for systematic data collection, which as researchers are critical for understanding what is happening, is often quite limited. In such instances, we rely on remote uh, data collection. Except in other conflict researchers are testing an array of remote research methods to gain insight on hard to access areas. This includes layering geospatial technologies, for example, um, geographic information systems, global positioning data, earth observation, and other forms of remote sensing. And we do this alongside all other sources of open data. That's news, social media, um, even anonymized data is now being used from mobile phones to understand how people are moving. And that's critically important when you have people uh, fleeing conflict zones are being pushed out. I know similar methods in many ways are often also employed by climate, in climate risk analysis. I'm going to defer to Nick uh, to talk a little bit more about this, but I think there's an increasing effort to try to marry these, these, these two spheres. Um, one of the uh, panel participants who, couldn't, who actually couldn't make it, uh, weather, the Weathering Risk uh, Organization, I, you can see that they're trying to take climate risk analysis and put it alongside conflict analysis. We're, we, we're also trying to do the same thing. I think it can be done, this is not a comment on anyone trying to do it, I think there's more we can do. And, there's, and, and we need to do it better. I have, um, just to illustrate this, you know, sort of what you can try to do and what still needs to be done, I have a, a brief example from the ACCEPT research. We spent some time earlier this year uh, trying to understand the impact on civilian communities of the conflict in, the, in Ethiopia's Tigray region and its potential regional implications. So if, for those of you that are familiar with Ethiopia, even before the outbreak of the conflict in the Tigray region in November 2020, it, the, the area was assessed to be food insecure up to crisis levels, in part due to drought and to um, locusts. So what we sought to do was to mix field data on livelihoods and humanitarian needs that the World Food Pro Program was trying to collect on the ground, as well as other um, field data from, the, from uh, about community coping, with satellite data to assess the ways in which the conflict was disrupting agriculture or actually, um, or potentially altering the pattern of agriculture to, as part of an evolving conflict economy. 
We use satellite data in one instance to look at the extent of uh, cropped land over successive planting cycles. And we could see that even at the height of the conflict in late 2021, uh, during one of the harvest cycles, the, areas, the area of planted land, cropped land in northern Ethiopia was extensive. But then when we looked at successive planting cycles, we could see that the actual harvest occurred later than it normally should. And comparing this to World Food Program data, we can see that this it was, there was a delayed harvest. And there was actually, um, though it, all that land that was cropped was not actually harvested, much withered and was later burned. And the field data showed us that this was due to um, inputs lacking, uh, animals, people, uh, fertilizer, all the things that you might need but can't get access to in the middle of a conflict. Why is, it, why is this useful to know? It gives an in indication of how the donor community should target res response responses in order to sustain livelihoods amid conflict. And if we can do this analysis again, which, I, which I'd love to right now because we're in another harvest cycle, it can help build evidence on how communities are adapting to ongoing stresses, be they conflict or climate. And then the other point I want to make that's important is there was something really missing in the analysis we tried to do rapidly earlier this year. We really wanted to understand what was planted. We wanted to know if people were planting subsistence crops or changing their crops in or because they were planting locally and trying to gain food. We wanted to understand if they were planting cash crops to sustain a conflict economy. What we couldn't analyze, because we're conflict researchers, even using the satellite data, was what type of crop was planted. And it's an illustration for us about the ways that we need to um, interact and collaborate with climate scientists and livelihood, livelihoods experts in order to be able to have a whole picture about what we think is happening, even when we can't easily get access on the ground. That raises an important point from my perspective, and I want to make sure I, I, I emphasize it. I'm talking a lot about remote analysis and data collection. I don't want to um, underplay the importance of field research for, for, for conflict researchers. We do try to get into conflict-affected areas. Some of our partners are getting in to unst unstable areas. One of them, Conciliation Resources, a peace-building organization working with the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex University are in East Africa, they're also in, what, conciliation resources are also in West Africa, working with local pastoralists to understand cross-border movements of herders, the frictions that arise, how this Im impacts peace and security, and to try to build a, um, a local action network be, uh, between communities, communities and, and governments, governments across borders, to understand what needs to be enhanced in terms of their interactions in order to reduce frictions. So don't, don't mistake me, I'm not, we're not just one or the other, we are, the mixed methods is a very important point here. Mix specializations, mix your methods. Ultimately, it's all about this, another point that I, that I mentioned, which is what's it all for? Conciliation resources, participatory research on the ground to try to get a action-oriented, locally grounded network to think about what policy response, you know, what the, what the adaptation needs to be in terms of local interactions. It, it brings me back to the earlier point in, in my presentation. Conflict research, is, you know, our research and most conflict research really is trying to inform the public. It's in trying to inform policymakers to really think about the layered and integrated interactions that need to be brought together to respond to um, intractable and protracted crises. This is what many in the international community, World Bank, UN, OECD, referred to as the humanitarian development security nexus. It needs to be layered, it needs to be integrated, it needs to operate in the near term to respond to the crisis imperative, and it needs to think over time. I'm noting this because I think as Nick is going to mention, there's a bit of a dichotomy here in how we operate. Those of us that work on conflict are constantly pressed by the need to respond to the near-term imperative, to the crisis imperative, to the, to the humanitarian need. We try to do that while seeding the ground for longer-term peace building, um, stability over the long term, and development and growth. That's what you're trying to get to. But we operate in many ways on different planes. Those of us responding to crises um, sometimes have to take a short-term view. Those responding to climate um, uh, change are often thinking in the longer term. The inability to gain access to um, conflict-affected areas sometimes pushes 
the climate community to really be thinking more about the fragile areas, the places you're trying to prevent conflict from, from occurring in. We have to figure out a way, and I'd love to, in this um, discussion today, talk about how these elements can come together in coming back to that whole. Um, you unravel threads of the, of the conflict system, but you kind of really want to think about uh, temporal space, near term, long term. You want to think about your um, uh, various causal factors, not just one or the other. And you want to think about uh, responses that work across the spectrum of sectors and across time. And I think I, I'll, kind of, I'll kind of leave it there. Uh, just a last note on the kinds of responses once we get to the, um, the discussion period that we're thinking about from a conflict research pers perspective. For us, it is a conflict stabilization, but we're also aiming toward um, supporting livelihoods, effective government, governance, social cohesion, um, and breaking the, the tie that evolves over time between the licit and the illicit in a conflict space. That's just to show you how all the complex and uh, knotty problems that we're dealing with in conflict layer onto that, climate stresses and climate change, and it, it almost seems overwhelming. I, we, shouldn't look, we shouldn't allow that to distract us from the need to begin to work together more effectively. I'll leave it there and turn it over to Nick. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so our next speaker is a climate risk adaptation specialist. We'll speak from the perspective of, of a climate adaptation practitioner working with teams and partners operating um, in conflict settings. So thanks, Nick. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, Ruth. In, in the spirit of mixed specializations, uh, I'll be giving the perspective of a climate adaptation um, practitioner working with Commonics and Commonics partner teams in uh, conflict settings such as Ukraine, Yemen, and Southern Africa. Um, I don't want to cover ground that's already been covered. I think Ruth and Brian did a, a great job of providing synopsis of how climate can be a trigger for conflict. Um, but I, I do want to provide a additional lens that looks at uh, conflict um, as a, as a trigger, especially in terms of the response to climate. We, we often talk about uh, climate itself uh, prompting more conflict, but oftentimes it's the adaptation recommendations and interventions that can also lead to, to conflict. Uh, take, for example, the construction of a dam that may seem like a perfectly logical and reasonable thing to do to augment flooding or provide irrigation and domestic water use for an upland community but can then turn into a large transboundary conflict downstream. Case in point, uh, Ethiopia and the conflict with, with Sudan and Egypt that's happening right now. And I think the main takeaway there is that we need to be very wary of interventions without doing the kind of systems mapping that Ruth mentioned and, and understanding uh, how those decisions could result in, in conflict downstream. And the second, I think, really key interaction and in, in, in conflict and climate that um, uh, I'll speak to just momentarily is uh, climate impacts as a symptom of conflict. And we're seeing this more frequently, especially in areas where we have large movements of people that are displaced due to a conflict. So Commonics is, is managing a project right now in Yemen called the Yemen Peace Building Project and working with a lot of the actors in Yemen currently um, and just this last April, uh, there were some severe floods that uh, affected the displaced um, uh, and refugee folks that were in camps. And the government at the time had claimed that this area was flood safe. Um, unfortunately, the number of people that were displaced from those camps or were affected um, were really a, a victim, not of the conflict necessarily, but the concentration uh, of exposure because they had ended up in a place that was deemed safe. And this is through, through you know, a, a, an assessment by the government using historical data. And my point there is that the climate aspect needs to be incorporated where we're evaluating climate risk, even in places where people don't live, but might potentially end up because of conflict. Um, and the second big area, I think that's a symptom of of, uh, of conflict due to, due to climate change is really it weakens people's response to climate change. And you don't have to look far back in history if you look at the Ukraine uh, 
and Russia um, conflict, or rather the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine um, has been um, receiving an enormous amount of support from you know, USAID and other partners, and, and, and Commonix is playing a role in a, a project there called Ukraine Agro, where you know, large uh, grain processors are being handed over to replace uh, you know, infrastructure that was damaged due to the Russian invasion. And that's great. It's, it's stopping the bleeding. It's providing food security for those that are dependent on, on exports from, from Ukraine. However, no one is talking about drought resilience. And that is an area of the world that is producing an enormous amount of food. And um, they're losing precious time, you know, obviously reacting, understandably so, uh, to some of the food security risks. Um, however, we, we are, are missing our moment to start working in, in climate sensitive um, agriculture there. And then the, the last point there, just on the, the interactions between conflict and climate, is how climate impacts can be weaponized to further drive the wedge of, of conflict. Um, and, and here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking mostly about the opportunistic um, op like techniques and, and, and actions by you know, militia groups or those involved in conflict to take advantage of the fact that there, there might be a large swath of the population that now is out of work displaced, not engaged in a particular livelihood or education system. Um, and you don't have to look far for this, this either. I mean, this, this has been cited as, as one of the main reasons that um, you know, the ISIS was able to recruit so heavily um, that led up to, to the conflict. And there's been some really great work on this. I'll just cite quickly. Um, in 2003, Robert Engelman wrote a, a kind of seminal paper on the type of demographic characteristics that might lead to conflict and found that countries where over 40% of the population was between the ages of 15 and 29 were twice as likely to be involved in a conflict. And found very similar statistics for uh, urbanization rates. And I'm not mentioning this because it's a primary driver in all conflicts. It's obviously very uh, idiosyncratic, as, as Ruth mentioned. But it is important to look at those type of demographic characteristics and factors that could be involved uh, in a potential conflict. And from an climate adaptation perspective, we need to think about what kind of factors could lead to a conflict before a project begins through some of that, that system mapping. Um, I do want to touch on challenges a bit because I think um, Ruth, Ruth did a, a good job of covering those, but from the perspective of a, a climate practitioner operating sometimes in conflict zones, um, it's not the first choice to work in a conflict area because objectives can be very hard to achieve. Uh, for, for a number of reasons, but, but largely due to the differences in time scale and the uh, lack of, of community support, um, understandably so, because there are shifting power dynamics of the communities that are being effective. And oftentimes to carry out adaptation plans, um, you need decades and you need leaders that are vested in that area. Um, and when the geographic location is in question, uh, it's very hard to make place-based adaptation uh, recommendations. And, and that takes me to the last challenge, which is really more of a problem with climate adaptation itself. And it's that so much of our work is location-based. And uh, I'll just point an example here from uh, some of our work in, in Southern Africa, where we're looking at areas um, through a program called Resilient Waters, um, where there might be changes to the climate that might make it very difficult to grow key crops. And what are the climate risks facing you know, these folks in these areas? What kind of livelihood options exist? And we're finding that you know, there are three to four really key staple crops that will be um, incredibly difficult to grow under growing aridity uh, as well as water access issues. And not often do, do a million people migrate um, without going unnoticed. And given the, the adjacency to certain borders, um, a large number of these people will likely not pick up an alternative livelihood, let's be honest, they will migrate. And so we have to think about what options are in place there. And it's not just a technical problem, it's a political solution that we have to start talking about. Um, okay, so that's all the bad news. Um, a few solutions <laughs> I'd like to offer <laughs> from a climate adaptation perspective. Um, is, and I think I said this before, traditional adaptation is just simply not enough. If you look at the IPCC's definition of adaptation, it is an adjustment 
two climate risks. And I think that says all that you need. Um, in a conflict setting, adjustments aren't fast enough. They're not transformative enough. Um, some of the, the more common climate adaptation practices are looking at, in agriculture at least, uh, alternative crops. Um, or it could be um, you know, potentially some, some climate smart agriculture or development of infrastructure. Um, and these things take time, they're location-based, they're very incremental. And so I'm gonna say something that sounds very trite at COP, we need to be more ambitious. We need to find the variables and we also need to identify the solutions that are really gonna take a community uh, beyond the conflict itself. And, and that long lasting kind of durable view, I think also needs to get at the heart of the reasons for the conflict. Um, and in some cases that might mean engaging certain groups very early in the project. Youth engagement, education programs, workforce development, in some cases, it might mean better alert systems to prevent a massive shock that then induces a large population and concentrates them in a highly uh, or climate sensitive area. Um, I think we also need to focus more on conflict sensitive adaptation. And this is a new subfield of adaptation planning that incorporates a peace and security lens. Um, a lot of this is documented in, in the guidance that Ruth mentioned earlier. Uh, a weathering risk methodology by our partners at Adelphi as well as PIK. And really what it drives home is the need for bottom-up mapping, understanding the actors and the potential victims and perpetuators of conflict, and then trying to really understand those triggers. Which leads me to, to the last solution here is, is the need to harmonize those conflict scenarios at the systems mapping stage with climate scenarios. And it is complex, uh, and it's an empirical process um, that, that can take quite a bit of work and time up front, but I think we need to invest that time and that thinking uh, before we turn directly to the technology. So I think I'll end there. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, our, our next speaker um, is going to talk about how uh, underlying structural inequalities um, which help shape quality of life outcomes in urban areas can be exacerbated by climate change and potentially lead to unrest. Uh, Paul, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, really excited to, to have heard these two inputs and, and to reflect a little bit on, on how they apply to uh, our work. Um, I look after the Urban Systems Unit at ICLE Africa, and our role is really uh, to help local governments think more deeply about what systems approaches actually look like in their contexts. Um, and to try and apply some of these systems uh, interventions to uh, connect priorities across departments. Uh, and in a way, I've, I've really liked a few of the, the words that have emerged from the, the inputs that have come, which uh, I'll, I'll share my keywords. Uh, I've written a mess where Nick can see my notes and probably thinks I'm crazy, but, but uh, this will be a bit of a meander and I, I hope we'll uh, uh, provide some food for thought and some, some ideas for, for the conversation that follows. Um, Coming back to this point on climate as a risk multiplier, I think is, is a way my touch point on, uh, on this conversation. Uh, I focus uh, mainly on uh, resources and access um, and what urbanization and related process is going to mean for this. So the conversation on cities has to be the, the <coughs> classic entry point. Oh my goodness, we're rapidly urbanizing. How are we going to deal with this? Uh, we are urbanizing two and a half times faster than uh, cities in the global north, uh, in the global south. Uh, we are seeing about 250,000 people uh, born in or move to cities every day. So that's, uh, I did these stats for, for someone else's speech, but I'll use them because I find them fun. That's a new Nairobi every 16 days, uh, a Denver every four days, a Shanghai every four months. Uh, you know, this, the, the speed of this is uh, utterly insane. Um, I, I think part of the reason we do this work is because uh, these embedded entrenched systems uh, fascinate us and that challenge is, is an exciting one to grapple with. Uh, so with a rapid population growth, obviously there are going to be rapid increases in resource needs uh, and this comes to this point, uh, we simply don't have the infrastructure set up or available yet. And so the first key word for this point, and, and uh, uh, Nick has made the uh, connection already, is access. Um, and I really like that point on, on rapid urbanization um, and uh, uh, young populations being uh, correlated to conflict uh, because when you don't have enough resources available or the infrastructures to provide them uh, you are going to see those types of uh, conflicts 
emerge. So to me, I'm not necessarily going to focus on uh, conflict as a, uh, as, a, as a driver in itself, but, but looking at some of the everyday conflicts of the user and the system, the resident in the city and the infrastructure that they are trying to, uh, to use. Um, so, so these types of climate shocks that we're seeing, a COVID shock, uh, a war in another context entirely providing a shock, uh, is really just exacerbating an underlying issue of access. What's curious to me in this work is that a lot of the policy uh, approaches for resources are focused on supply. How do we get more food? How do we get more water? How do we get more energy? Uh, and aren't necessarily paying uh, deeper attention to the question of access or the quality of product that they're delivering. Um, so because of this, these slow crises tend to be overlooked. We don't notice that between 10% and 40% of children in many different countries in Africa are suffering from stunting. It's, it's not on the radar. Um, people might be feeding themselves starches, they're not hungry, but we're missing the nutritional uh, crisis that's under, underpinning that. Uh, Cape Town, and I'll speak about Cape Town as a major case, got massive publicity as the first city, first global city in the world to run out, to almost run out of water. Uh, and, and it got that focus, yet cities right now are running out of water and dealing with the same issues, yet don't uh, uh, necessarily receive that attention. Um, residents in cities that have water access uh, might not be accessing water uh, uh, as, or clean water as effectively as they should be. So um, effectively our role is to tell, try and work out how local governments can uh, look at these systems and with limited resources uh, and an overwhelming burden of urbanization, uh, try to uh, uh, take off multiple priorities uh, at once. So to dive into to a first example around, uh, I haven't said my keywords. I told you it was going to be a meander. Uh, access as the one, slow crises, <laughs> the role of translators and the idea of social infrastructure. So in trying to get local governments, and these will hopefully come up in the, in the topics, in trying to get local governments to think uh, about their role in uh, improving water access, improving food access, for example, uh, there needs to be uh, a translator in there. Someone who will draw together the different departments who in a way have their own clear mandates, someone who will help translate from a national level or global level uh, to local level. Um, because in a way we've got a lot of expertise in these places, but they're not provided the opportunities to uh, mix and speak across their own expertise. Uh, so in that translation work, what's been really interesting to me is the idea of an internal champion who often does that connecting because of a passion, going a bit beyond their own mandate, but then an outsider promoter, someone who validates their work. It'd be really curious to talk to someone in a city who is trying to push an agenda and doesn't manage to get traction, yet when the idea comes from outside, uh, it gains political traction. That's more of an anecdote than a clear narrative. So, in 2016, uh, the rains failed in Cape Town. And uh, this was something we're quite familiar with. The city of Cape Town has a really sophisticated set of uh, restrictions uh, designed to encourage citizens or explain to citizens how they can reduce uh, their water consumption by uh, not watering their garden with a hose, but using a bucket, uh, not washing their cars at certain times, watering gardens in mornings, things like that. And uh, then the rains failed again in 2017. Uh, and suddenly this word crisis sort of emerged, not just a drought, but oh my goodness. Uh, after the fact, we are able to look at this and say that this is an unprecedented once in a thousand time occurrence, and yet we lived through it. And uh, seeing the, the way that the city responded from a technical perspective was to say, okay, we're consuming at about uh, 1.2 billion liters of water a day, we need to reduce the demand, and they proposed 500 million liters, and then provide new supply um, to 500 uh, million liters um, through groundwater abstraction, desalination, and things like that. And what was really interesting to me is there was a direct acknowledgement of using a social uh, intervention and a technical uh, intervention uh, to change that. And in 18 months, uh, by golly, they did. Demand came down to 500 million liters a day. Um, there was a lot of political mobilization around the idea of day zero, um, which 
deepened the urgency with which people needed to participate in this. But what's interesting is that by that time, none of the technical interventions had come on board. And then you know, to your point on timescale, uh, that's a really interesting uh, piece that the social infrastructure, the social uh, shifts were the things that uh, could reduce uh, the water consumption uh, quite quickly and the technology uh, took a while to come in. A reflection on, on some of their public awareness and, and what I found interesting and, and what worked was they deployed, and I don't think they used this frame, but, but I did, uh, a number of different uh, public awareness approaches explaining what the system is to the citizen, how do, how do you get your water, showing where they fit into the system, and then explaining in really nice ways how they can actually influence the system. So there was an infographic, for example, put out uh, how to live a 50 liter life. 10 liters for a shower a day, nine liters for dishwashing, five liters for drinking, five liters for house cleaning, one liter for cooking, uh, etc. And what was then intriguing is you can, you can put all this information out there, but why should people bother to make that change was the piece that needed to be answered. So uh, punitive measures, uh, some installation of, of uh, uh, smart water meters that would cut off after a certain point. Uh, there was a big issue around that as a, a very um, um, draconian approach. Um, and positive measures, uh, be a leader in your um, neighborhood and if you're reducing at the correct level you'll get a little green dot on uh, the collective map. Uh, mayor going around uh, talking to people, encouraging people, exciting people about this. Um, and so there was a whole sense of social togetherness in some communities, obviously uh, a number who, who weren't necessarily participating or excited by it, uh, to, to uh, collectively avoid day zero. Um, so I found that quite interesting. I feel like my meander is going a bit long, but I, I wonder if the food one, do I have time for a food uh, exploration? Let me, let, me, let me try and do it in brief terms. In African cities, we are trying to get people to talk more about access to food. The national priority is making more food available, and the national priority doesn't really think about uh, the, what's called the missing middle. How do we get from the farm to uh, the consumer what are the opportunities for processing and things like that. And cities, therefore, in a way, don't feel that food is necessarily their mandate. It's the national government agriculture de uh, department that must organize food. Uh, and in the way that these national departments are even named is agriculture or livestock. There's no word about food or nutrition. And so that often just gets uh, missed. So our work is really to help local governments find that they do have a mandate for food in their urban planning processes in their control over food markets in cities, uh, in public health, environmental safety, waste management, um, and, uh, and those spaces. When COVID hit, the response was we need to separate people. And in African cities, that meant in many ways uh, moving informal vendors out of markets off the streets. Yet that is how most people get their food in uh, many of these cities. In Cape Town and South Africa, what emerged to help feed people were community action networks providing food. The main reflection on that and speeding my reflection was, uh, we can't keep giving people food. The system is broken. There is a structural issue. So the great outcome, and I think this is true across many contexts for COVID, was an acknowledgement that there are structural issues underpinning uh, um, access to food, uh, food security, uh, and many other resource sectors. But those cans are another form of social infrastructure, coming forward and a huge mobilization of people to feed others. Uh, interesting uh, offerings of governments providing the municipal bus service to then move vendors around the city as opposed to having people come into uh, markets. Uh, and we saw that in Kampala. Similarly, an anecdote in South Africa uh, there was uh, a set of politically uh, directed uh, riots in uh, 2021 in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng uh, in which uh, trade infrastructures and food trade infrastructures were targeted and, and uh, uh, to a degree uh, destroyed in those spaces. But what was really interesting to see in that moment in South Africa was a shift from this idea of uh, government only responsibility for uh, providing services to a sense of communities coming forward to actually protect their assets, 
and to drive a development agenda. So again, a new form of social infrastructure uh, in a way unique to a bit of the South African uh, need. So maybe to reference a point on approaching crisis and, and, uh, and conflict from multi-levels and directions, I think the point on translation uh, is really important. Who is going to be the driver of that? Um, and this point of seeing structural issues emerge and the timeline with which we're working to address these issues. The social infrastructure seems to be really good for fast uh, addressing, but then the technology that was put in, for example, to reduce demand is what is now uh, keeping uh, our water consumption low in Cape Town, for example. Um, so yeah, eloquent finish. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so thank you for all those presentations. I think we want to move to a, a uh, a Q and A. Of course, we're like as always typical in these. We're running a bit long, but maybe if you can put up the Slido um, code again, I'll start with some questions I have here. But if anyone wants to uh, um, pose a question, we'll see if we have time to to answer. But you can do it through your your phone um, if you'd like. So <clears throat> let me see. So the first question I have here um, is, is for Ruth. So. Do you think you could use the, the approaches you described um, in your presentation I don't know, to facilitate or, or, or support some you know, uh, conflict early warning system for, for want of a better kind of term, something to help us understand where conflicts are, are likely to break out? Thanks, Brian. In, in my presentation, I mentioned that figuring out the answer to integrated responses was a holy grail. Um, there's, there's always there's kind of two sides of conflict research. There's analysis of the problem, and then there's um, consideration of the response. On the analysis of the problem side, early warning is another holy grail, um, and one that I think you know, we're still searching for. So there's, and I appreciated your point, Nick, about getting to um, really understand how conflict scenarios and climate scenarios come together before you think about the technologies that you try to apply in response. There's a lot of discussion of late and there's uh, increasing sort of testing of machine, it, can machine learning help us begin to, if you put the right um, data inputs or the right, you find the right uh, factors that you put into a machine learning process, can you be predictive in understanding where conflict might break out? Recalling what I um, noted about the complexity of the system and the ways that um, so many different factors, again, political, economic, social, demographic, environmental, come together in each locale and depend on the con uh, and vary according to context, I think it's been hard to date to figure out a way to, um, well, it's been hard to design an approach that manages to capture all of that. Um, put all the factors in and then say, in this place where we have not yet seen conflict, we can tell you that the stresses are rising in a way that conflict is, like, conflict is likely to occur. That doesn't mean you can't discern patterns, and I think there has been research. I recall a recent study by Mercy Corps using some um, open source data on where violence had occurred alongside where there had been um, particular kinds of uh, climate stresses to see that they coincide. Like You, you can find ways to look at some of the factors together, increasingly using um, uh, an array of methods and sources to discern the patterns. But predictive analysis is, is really hard. Um, and then I, I find in, in terms of interventions for, the, for climate adaptation, Predictive analysis is hard. Maybe it's, it's, it's exceptionally hard when you're trying to think of all the things that drive conflict. I ha I, I'm kind of wondering whether if you're in the fragility space, if you haven't yet um, um, moved toward the explosion of violence, are there ways to look at um, the elements that you described in terms of um, sensitivities, weaknesses, vulnerabilities that you can actually see might be climbing to, get, to, to put those into together in some way that might give you a better predictor toward what is coming down the pike. So I, I, I have, a, it's a bit of a non-answer. I don't think we've actually cracked the code uh, for um, uh, predicting when conflict could occur. I think we're still surprised. 
I think we can definitely find ways to um, see, think about resurgent violence in areas that you have uh, calm. There's always warning signs about what will happen next. And then I wonder whether if you're, if you're operating in the fragile context in places that haven't yet erupted, whether some of those warning signs that, that we spoke about today can actually come together to give you a bit of a sense now that we see um, you see these patterns emerging in other conflict affected zones, whether those warning signs can be more discernible than they might have been in the past. But um, it, it remains the holy grail, I think. Well, thank you. know, and, and maybe prediction is, 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 is too uh, loaded a, a word. But as you say, with, with patterns, I, I think, you know, as a practitioner, people are looking to, to develop programs. You know, they're, they're, of course, we have this concept you know, that many use, um, no regrets kind of programming. So, okay, so you've got programs that you're going to do. They're going to be you know, seated somewhere. You're going to be doing some of these resilience building and development. So you know, I, I think you can probably, if, if we can discern patterns, I mean, if you have to go for A, B, or C, choosing those that may most likely are following some of those patterns might be beneficial. Um, and of course, the work you're doing would be uh, beneficial and any case, so that's no, an interesting. Can, um, I, can I make one interjection? Uh, yeah. It's not to, and it's not to disagree with you. I think no regrets programming is exceptionally important. I think it's something that you, we, I struggle with when I think about conflict-affected environments. There's a lot of resources internationally poured poured into crisis response. Uh, there's enormous resources poured into uh, stabilization programming, and yet we come out seeing conflict. Uh, reemerge in some of the places that we've doing some intense programming. So it's balancing, mixing our responses in ways and, and, and understanding that system better so that we actually can have no regrets programming, but also program we feel confident and we can begin to see the results on, I think is critically important because there's definitely a sense that we are not, we're stressed in many ways and the donor community is stressed and the international community is stressed with some major crises ahead of us. Um, we have to find a pragmatic and realistic way to invest our resources, our resources to make a difference. Okay. Thanks. Um, so my, my next question here, um, to Nick, okay, you, you talked a bit about um, some of the, you know, looking at some of the um, agriculture in, 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 in Southern Africa and some of that um, analysis you've done. I mean, do you have other examples? How have you seen climate impact analysis used to understand uh, climate related conflict risks? Yeah, it, it, it suggests that there are predictive capacities uh, in the modeling space for, for understanding and trying to pin down. The, the timing of conflict. And I just want to say, I too am allergic to the word prediction. I think meteorologists have ruined it for everybody. Um, so as a, as a climate specialist, I, I, I like to use projection because it's not deterministic. Um, and it also implies that there will always be some adaptive management along the way, right? We're not going to get things right every time, especially initially. Uh, but when you begin to monitor um, the explanatory variables for a conflict, see how they evolve, um, programming too should adjust over time. And, and I think that's true for, for any adaptation decision. Uh, but just putting my, my modeling hat on for a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this short. Um, I, I do see some advancements in the modeling space for combining climate models with uh, other models um, to better understand changes in, in sort of natural and, and in human systems. And I, I do think the work by um, uh, Delphi and PIK on the weathering risk methodology uh, really outlined this well. Um, they took a very ambitious approach to coupling climate models with health systems, uh, agriculture, um, responses in vegetation to changes in climate, as well as the hydrodynamic context um, by which we, we, we see climate um, conditions changing. And all of those are important because climate models tell us a lot about, you know, temperature change and extremes and, and precipitation intensity um, under a given scenario, under a given location, but they're highly uncertain in the timing uh, of those changes. And they, they tend to underestimate the transient extremes that happen at a local level. And I think due to those uncertainties, we always have to be thinking about local data sets and local models that we can couple with climate models to make them real, to make them usable. And ultimately, if you're able to do that well, you get to this uh, understanding of the spatial distribution of potential 
climate impacts, uh, the potential severity, and then the exposure hotspots. So if there is some predictive power um, in understanding where, where exactly climate impacts will occur, we can understand where people might end up as well due to changes in climate conditions in an adjacent area or because there's a similar livelihood uh, option available there. And, and I think that gives modelers as well as uh, folks doing the technical interventions uh, a lot of ammo to work with. And then uh, they can then reach across to other specialties um, like Paul to work on some of the, the kind of social infrastructure, the social capital that's needed uh, to, to kind of augment or, or reduce some of the potential impacts if those slow onset changes, you know, like drought or water scarcity, turn to a shock. Um, and, and having that um, in place and having those dual disciplines working at the same time is incredibly important. Thanks. And that's actually a perfect lead into what I wanted to ask uh, Paul. All right. Big question. Um, what would you say the top two to three things which a city could do to, to proactively uh, better prepare themselves for climate impacts and, and enhance the resilience of, of their people? So. If you had the ears of, of you know, as I know you do, many you know city leaders, but whatever around the world, what would you say? Are there some commonalities? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of interesting just to reflect a bit on what Nick was talking about in terms of, of the value of, of uh, climate models, and and to add another another point of value is to have them as a boundary object around which you can bring stakeholders together for conversation. You know, the obvious answer in a way is a resilience plan strategy uh, and a climate plan strategy. Uh, so, so I'll have to put that as, as one of it is, you know, and the process of developing that will hopefully also create a bit of an infrastructure with which you'll, you'll um, respond to any type of shocks. So ideally, you've done it through a multi-stakeholder process. Ideally, you've done it in alignment with your other uh, policies so that you have a clear understanding of how resources can uh, funnel down to address a risk. How is it aligned with a, a National Disaster Act or anything like that? Um, a sudden uh, shock, sorry. Um, but ideally, you would have done that planning in a way that means you have a multi-stakeholder uh, convener uh, and, and uh, uh, platform that can come together to actually quickly mobilize uh, and respond. I don't think we have properly excited our urban planners about the power that they have to address multiple structural issues. In so many of the uh, areas that we've been talking about, water, food, uh, waste management, uh, you know, trying to help interpret what an earth circular economy means uh, at the local level, um, one of the key recommendations that always comes out is uh, to have, uh, to engage urban planning uh, to make uh, better space for public amenity, to uh, properly think about how you are locating your industries from a circular economy perspective, uh, how you uh, are engaging uh, with transport systems. A lot of people will talk about mobility only through the lens of, of uh, transport mode without actually thinking about where people are living and working. Um, so planning as a systems tool I think we often decry planners because it needs to be, here's the plan, we follow it to the T, it's a linear kind of idea, but in a way, using planning as a way to, to especially spatial planning, but development planning in general as a way to enact uh, systems on the ground, I think would be my, uh, my main call. Not being a planner, I can't give you the technical details exactly of the type of planning, but um, having them as key actors in this is, is, is vital. Um, because that actually puts a lot of these big, broad concepts into something uh, real on the ground. The best thing a city can do is notice what's happening in other places and start to have these conversations about what does that look like in our context. So for example, when riots broke out in Gauteng and, and KwaZulu-Natal, some colleagues uh, in uh, uh, Cape Town uh, came together and said, what if this happens here? What is our readiness plan? So being able to pay attention and, and yes, devote some resources into, into thinking about that and mobilizing partners for that. Brian, can I off offer a thought? Please. So, uh, A, you mentioned no regrets programming, and then you asked 
sort of what are the top, what, what advice, you know, what are the top interventions? I'm actually, I, I think I'm hearing something across all of our discussion today that, that I, I, I caught it when you said social inf infrastructure, Paul. Um, it, it, it seems relevant to me in the urban context. Um, it seems relevant to me, you know, we, we, we address, again, conflict and climate. That's in urban spaces, it's in peripheries. I think a lot about it in peripheries because I'm thinking about how conflicts cascade across borders and regions, but though there are tensions between those two spaces. Nick, you talked about youth engagement, education programming, and work programs. It, I was thinking about all, the field research that, that some of our partners do, and I mentioned conciliation resources on the pastoralist networks and the local communities. This concept of social infrastructure, I think, is exceptionally important. Mm. Um, you create communities with a certain amount of its resilience to withstand uh, instability, um, its um, tools to adapt to stresses, and then um, it's also pathways to engage with um, governing actors and, and, and a certain amount of empowerment mm -hmm. so that um, various actors in the system, local level up to uh, you know, uh, national level, are actually communicating with each other, and then trans cross-border or transnational are communicating with each other about the challenges and then um, coordinating on potential solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so to me, your point about social infrastructure is a, is a critical one, and I think I mm -hmm. hear it across everything that we said. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be one of your no regrets areas. Right. Well, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> Can we're I? actually, we're just about out. So let me, um, but I, I think, you know, what, what you're saying is, is great. And it's something that I've heard before and it makes a lot of sense where, you, you know, the, the, the plan is one thing, but it's the process of bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Communication is, is often um, more important than the, the product itself, getting something that people can get around and talk. Um, so I'm just, maybe I'll, 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 I'll take one question that we had from the audience um, as a final question. Um, um, and thanks everyone for, for their patience and participation. So we've got a question kind of, we, we've a few of us talked about all the different multi disciplines that are involved in this. You know, we've had agriculture, there's governance, there's climate and conflict. Um, so once you open the door, you say, okay, look, you know, conflict, the, the, these interactions are, are very multifaceted. How do you know how far to go? And then how, when is it too far? You could always include, okay, we need the ag people, we need the water people, we need you know, the health people, the governance people. H at what point is that? How do you balance between having too much input from everyone you know, that might stop you just from moving forward? Uh, taking a multi-sectoral or an interdisciplinary approach doesn't mean that you always need full consensus to act. I, I think you have to come to a, um, uh, a best case uh, response given, and this, th th that is also, it's, it, it exemplifies crisis response. You, you don't always have full consensus, but you need to move. So I, I don't think we should mistake the, the, the notion that we need more sectors and specializations to come together for something that requires that everybody sit down and agree. I think what you need is enough inputs that you can make an informed decision about the right uh, response. And you need to go, especially in a conflict situ situation. Nick Paul, something to add? That was very well said. I'll just say there's no such thing as perfect information. And um, there is such a thing as being prepared to, to fail or maybe not even get it right the first time. And, and, and that's, I think, the role of adaptive management is adjusting approaches and processes and finding out where are the information gaps and including those disciplines and those people as early as possible so that you can start to move to decisions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love that question. I mean, it's, it's a question that I tangle with a lot is, is, do we need everyone to be a systems champion and a systems practitioner? You know, does everyone need to know how the whole systems work, how the whole system works in order for them to find their space? And, and I, um, I think it's, it's often nice for people to get that sense of meaning, um, but I think it's really a balance of, of your specialists and your generalists. Um, and I think the, the way that our kind of scientific world has shaped us is, is uh, many more specialists uh, with clear uh, and specific mandates um, and only a few generalists to draw the links and to make sense of it or to set the mandates in the first place. And so what I'm seeing is the need for more of those generalists who are our systems thinkers to do the connecting.
Um, but, uh, but an answer to, you know, when is it too much? No, 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 more, 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 more. And, and uh, I, ideally more qualified, more uh, well-engaged, uh, you know, uh, specialists uh, will always be needed. Uh, and an easy comparison, and I think we were talking before our session about this, is, is uh, large metros have fabulous human resources. Um, you know, an entire waste department or an entire uh, water department to, to uh, look after that space. Uh, but intermediate cities um, might have one person in charge of that whole thing. Uh, and so the burden on them is enormous for them to field and, and do this work. So, so uh, we need them to be resourced with more people. Uh, yeah, I think with, with the capacity building trope that we, we bring on, uh, to a degree it's about knowledge, uh, but in many spaces it's actually just about getting more people resourced to do the work. Great. Well, Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we should, uh, we'll have to call it here.